I'm Dave Boos. I'm pastor of Hebron Independent Church of Cade, South Carolina. I hope and I pray that the words you hear each day from the news broadcast and from the internet are not too depressing, that they do not cause you to lose hope. And I can only hope that the words I offer today might be a lamp under your feet and a light under your path. And I thank you for being with us. If you listen to people who are going through difficult times, you often hear this plaintive cry. If I only had more money, I would. Or if I only had more time, I could. But rarely do you hear anyone pray Solomon's prayer. Oh Lord, give me more wisdom and knowledge. Yet it is God's wisdom that we need the most as we face the situations and circumstances of each day. Circumstances that are often too difficult for us to face alone. Solomon in his Proverbs 3, 13 through 15, encourages us to seek after God's wisdom with these words. I'm using New International Version here. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. When I began this series of studies, Seeking God's Wisdom in Troubled Times, several weeks ago, I quoted those words from the Proverbs and also these words from Proverbs 16, 16. How much better to get wisdom than gold, to choose understanding than silver. From the very beginning of our study, it has never been my intention to try to find all the biblical references on wisdom and knowledge and understanding, and then explain them in such a simple and profound way that you could instantly understand them and put them to work for you. That task would be far too great for me. Simply the word wisdom is used over 200 times in the scriptures and the word wise another 300 times. The word for know or knowledge is over 1,350 times in the scriptures. And so there is no way I could look at each one of those references and try to draw truth from it and then make an application. But I hope that in some way I might demonstrate for you that God's word has been given to God's people during troubled times and difficult days, and that he can guide us as we face similar circumstances to what they saw when the words were written. In the past few weeks, we've looked at some of the prophets of God. I've always been amazed that the times and the conditions that they encountered in their day are pretty much the same as what we face today. Four major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, as well as most of the minor prophets, were God's voice to his people from about 760 to about 500 BC, about 250 years of troubled times. And the prophets, these men used images and words and actions to convey the truth of God to his people. They did foretell future events often. And those future events, when they came to pass, validated the words of the entire message. But the messages were more than just omens and warnings and more than predictions and signs of the time. The messages proclaimed the holy and sovereign and almighty God and his covenant with his people. They explained the problem that sin had caused in keeping God's people far away from him. The penalties and the judgment that would face them because of the rebellion, the idolatry and immorality of the people of God. But they also looked beyond all of that and promised that those who repent and return to God and trust him will be blessed. That God has an eternal plan which affects all of them. But then, as well as now, so often we like to focus on the sensational. We look at the ifs and the maybes of tomorrow rather than the harsh realities of today. Many of us are like the disciples of Jesus in Matthew 24. It's the week before Jesus' death. He takes the disciples out to the Mount of Olives across from the temple. And they look down over the city and over the temple. But as they had walked, Jesus had told them, he foretold, he prophesied the destruction of the temple and the city. The disciples asked him, when will these things happen? And what are the signs of your return and of the end of the ages? 
Well, Jesus did tell them that there'll be wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes in diverse places. And this has been true from that day to this day. But that they must learn to trust God to lead them through the troubled times that were to come upon them. In one of his books where he attempts to explain biblical prophecy, Tim LaHaye began his first chapter, A New Way to Study Prophecy, with these words. This is no time in history to avoid the study of future things, which is what prophecy is. LaHaye and so many others like him have written hundreds and thousands of books trying to make biblical prophecy understandable and pertinent to the preachers in the pulpit and also to those who are sitting in the pews. I believe that we should study the future things that are contained in prophecy, that we should look ahead and see what God's plan entails. But at the same time, biblical prophecy is so much more than that. When I was in college, several of us preacher boys, pastors of small churches near the college campus, met every Monday morning for coffee and donuts and talk. And every week, the same question came up. What did you preach on yesterday? Well, each week, one of the men, a little older than the rest of us, said, I preached on the second coming of Jesus. And after weeks of getting the same answer, one of the other fellows asked, he says, Paul, give your people a break. Some of them haven't heard about the first coming yet. Now, Vine's Dictionary describes prophecy. It is not necessarily or even primarily the foretelling of, it is a declaration of those things which cannot be known by any natural means. It is a foretelling of the will of God, and it may have references to the past, to the present, or to the future. Isaiah prophesied in Judah about 760 to 700 BC, and some of his words were glimpses of the future. He foretelled that God would do in sending his Messiah, his son, to earth. He talked about the birth of Jesus. He talked about the coming of the kingdom. But most of his writing was addressed to Judah and some to the Israel to their north, warning them of their sin and their unfaithfulness and the imminent judgment of God, which was coming. But they should look beyond the troubles that they faced to the coming of the Messiah and his kingdom. He wrote these words, there will be a time when all mankind will come and bow down before God. Jeremiah endured the, the siege of the city of Jerusalem. He, he lived through the hardships and hurts of his people. And when our government and religious leaders were led away captive, he remained in Jerusalem to comfort and to encourage those left behind, those whose city and temple and homes had been destroyed. Jeremiah had a ministry to defeated people, people whose hopes have been dashed before their very eyes. As we saw last week, he constantly spoke of a God who would bring the exiles back and of the plans that God had for his faithful people. The next three or four weeks, we'll probably visit Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel was a priest, a priest without a temple. Some of the brightest, best and brightest of Judah's young men, including Daniel and his friends, have been taken to Babylon as captives in 605 BC. This was the first siege of Jerusalem. The second group, including Ezekiel and King Jehoiachin. Now, King Jehoiachin was only 18 years old. He'd been king for, thir for three months. But they took him and Ezekiel and many others back in 597 BC. And then in 586, the Babylon Babylonian armies under Nebuchadnezzar came back and besieged the city of Jerusalem for 18 months starved the city and the nation into submission, destroyed the city and the temple and the nation, leaving behind only the poor and the helpless. Daniel was one of those captives taken in the first, uh, in the first removal, the first captivity. And he'd been trained by Babylon to be an administrator, to be a leader. He was forced to conform to their customs, but he never became one of them. He remained loyal to God and he survived several regime changes. In fact, he became the voice of God in the court of the kings of Babylon, of the Medes, and then of the Persians, including King Cyrus. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and many others. God's representatives to God's people. Prophets during days of change and turmoil. 
They had seen weak and corrupt politicians in Israel and Judah as, as the nation became weaker and weaker and more corrupt. They had seen even more powerful and more corrupt politicians in Assyria and Babylon and Persia, those who had controlled them and dominated them. Such leadership could only bring social and judicial injustice upon God's people. It made the, hard, the times even harder. It caused economic hardship, which included exile and oppression and slavery. And then you add to this the threatening of longtime enemies like Egypt to the south and Assyria to the north and Moab and Edom to the east. And Ezekiel even suggests some new enemies to come in the future, like Gog and Magog and perhaps even China. From that time of the prophets until today, Israel, the people of God, have seldom known peace or comfort. In Ecclesiastes 1, 9, Solomon says, What has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. I do not believe that the United States of America or any other nation, or even the Christians who are part of that nation, can any way replace Israel, the chosen people of God, and God's plan or his eternal purpose. However, many of the experiences endured by Israel and God's means of dealing with them and their unfaithfulness and their disobedience, they have not changed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 through 12, Paul wrote these words. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Today, we should be learning from their mistakes. We should be gaining strength from their weaknesses. But I see that our people have not learned from history at all. We have not learned from God's word. Rather, we tend to relive the errors and the failures and the faults of Israel and many other nations that have come before us. Now, when we look at Israel, if God disciplined them, and allowed his chosen people to go into captivity and into exile. Why should we in the United States of America think that he'll do anything less when we are concerned? On several occasions, Jesus asked the religious leaders, those who claim to know the law, those who interpret the law for others, have you not read in the scriptures? He implied that either they had not read it at all or they misunderstood what they read, or they simply refused to obey God's word. I've heard several preachers along the way that say they never preach from the Old Testament, almost boasting about it, never preach from the Old Testament. They claim we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace, and I agree with that. But at the same time, we must realize what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, where he says, all scripture, now get that, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God's word has answers for us each day. The only way we can get those answers out of here is to open it up and to read them and then to live them. God's word is filled with his wisdom. And the wisdom is in learning the principles and the truths of his word and applying that wisdom to the problems we face each day. The scripture is never out of date. The scripture is never out of style. The prophets often use the, the phrase, the word of the Lord came to me. And whenever and however the word of God comes to us, we'll be foolish to not heed it and to not put it to work in our lives. We must live out the word of God daily in difficult times. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. It is a lamp, lamp unto our feet, a light unto our paths. It gives us strength. It gives us courage. It gives us direction. It gives us hope. And we pray, Lord, that you might help us, motivate us to want to know more about your word, to read it each day. Not looking for little tidbits of wisdom, but Lord, looking for the wisdom that you have that, that, that gave us the word to begin with. 
Lord, we thank you again. We ask for your wisdom, your knowledge, as Solomon asked. We pray, Lord, that you would give us the strength and the courage to face each day. Lord, we do live in troubled times, and they will probably continue to live in troubled times. So, Lord, help us to know the one who sees beyond the problems of the day. And we thank you again. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you for being with me. I've enjoyed doing this lesson today, and I pray that you'll gain some truth from it. So we've been looking at the different ways of, of gaining God's wisdom. We have, have to realize that you cannot do it without this. We've got to take this word and open it up and read it. We've got to know what God has to say to us. From Genesis to Revelation, God has something he wants to tell us. And most of that is this little simple message. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but everlasting life. All of God's wisdom leads us to his son, Jesus Christ. All of God's wisdom leads us to the Father. We thank you again, and God bless you.